Hi, my name is Alan. I am a business designer and welcome to the Beyond Users podcast, where we learn about business to become better designers. In the 48th episode, I spoke with Rita Gunter McGrath, a world renowned thought leader and a professor at Columbia Business School. She has received the number one achievement award for strategy from the prestigious Thinkers 50 and has been consistently named one of the world's top 10 management thinkers. Her work often gets featured in the Harvard Business Review, which is one of the most important management journals in the world. She also wrote a few really interesting and important business books, two of them especially important also for the business design community. So one being Discovery Driven Growth, which introduces the Discovery Driven Planning, which is frequently used by many business designers to prototype with numbers. And secondly, the book called The End of Competitive Advantage, which basically explains why the idea of sustainable competitive advantage is no longer relevant in today's business world and what this means for the process of designing a business strategy. If you're also interested in learning more about business, I recommend checking out beyondusers.com where you can find a free 7-day mini MBA. So it's like an email course where over 7 days you get 7 emails explaining 7 different business design tools and business concepts relevant for designers. And now, without further ado, here is a conversation with Rita. Rita, first of all, thanks a lot for taking the time. I'm a big fan here. I've used your discovery driven planning for a very long time. So I'm very happy I have a chance today to talk to you. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. So let's jump straight in. So, um, you know, as someone who created this tool that I use almost on a daily basis, uh, I wanted to hear a little bit about, you know, how this whole tool came to be and maybe also for listeners who've never heard of the discovery driven planning. What is this tool anyway? So discovery driven planning had its origins in a series of case studies that I and my co-author did of corporate flops. So these were, you know, the big ones back in the day, it was TV cable week and Disney's ill-considered foray into Europe in the beginning. Um, and a uh, big perfume, <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, these seemingly low risk product line extensions that nonetheless turned into enormous disasters. And when we studied them, what we realized was there was a very consistent pattern to how these ventures went so dreadfully wrong. Um, Untested assumptions taken as facts, very few opportunities for low commitment testing, leaders sort of personally committed to this particular solution to a problem they perceived, very often all the money up front and big, big teams kind of marching into these spaces. And the fundamental insight we realized was that these were all ventures that were operating with a very high ratio of assumptions that people had to make relative to knowledge that they had, and yet they were being planned and managed as though they were the core business, as though they were low risk, low assumption environments. And that was the spark that got us to thinking about, well, how would you plan differently if your plan, instead of planning to prove that you were right because you knew what you were doing, what if instead you plan to learn? And that led us to a a five-part methodology, which was basically um, define what a good outcome would be, then decide what must be true for that outcome to occur, Um, do some benchmarking, you know, are you being realistic? Does does your projection require 2,000% of the total addressable market? (laughs) Then define operationally what you think you'll have to do to actually uh, make this thing happen. As you're doing all that, document assumptions. And the most important part of the technique is planning to what we call key checkpoints. And so a checkpoint is a moment that teaches you something. So today we would would very comfortably talk about... um, a B tests or prototypes, or I think Eric Reese calls it minimum viable products. Um, back then, that was not really so much the language. And at each at each checkpoint, what we recommend is what we call do a race assessment, which is do we redirect? Do we accelerate? You know, maybe maybe the time is right and we should move faster. Uh, do we continue or do we exit? And a lot of times back in those days, those questions were never asked. It was always the assumption was we're just going to keep going until we realize this. And so in the intervening decades since it was first published, um, what we've 
seen is people are really embracing this notion that you can pivot and you can change your direction and you know you can actually give yourself permission to learn, which has been one of the most gratifying parts of it. Yeah, maybe also for the listeners who are not that, you know, I mean, a lot of the people who, who are listening to this podcast maybe never went through the business school. So mm -hmm. why this is so revolutionary and why this is so interesting is maybe like I can talk from my experience, like going through a business school and me having to actually do a business plan. Mm -hmm. And the way this looked like was basically you took a spreadsheet and you had to come up with hundreds and hundreds of assumptions Uh, how many products or services you would sell in month one, month two, how many people you would need to do this, what's the cost of these raw materials, etc. And it would be like hundreds of assumptions basically baked in together and they're not adding to each other, they're like basically multiplying, they're multiplying your risk. So what you've done actually is basically just reverse engineered and said, said our basic assumption is that this is wrong, so how can we attack the most critical assumptions first, right? Yeah, indeed. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I talk about business school planning spreadsheets as quantifications of fantasy. Yeah, <laughs> I call them fairy tales. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Same idea. Yeah, exactly. So maybe to, just to bring this to life, can you talk a, lot, a little bit more about the Disney example? That's the one that you also covered in the Harvard Business Review article, mm -hmm. like just to bring it to life. Like what, sure. what, is, what goes wrong when we get these assumptions wrong and what is the right way to do it? Absolutely. So let, let's sort of put this in historical context. So um, Disney uh, and their theme park business was actually the brainchild of Walt Disney, the, the founder of the company. And he thought, well, if people love going to the movies and seeing the characters act on, on the screen, wouldn't it be fantastic if we could create an actual physical environment where people could go and experience some of that magic? And his first theme park was out in California. And everybody said, Walt, you are nuts. Nobody's going to pay all this money to stand out in the hot California sun and watch, you know, Mickey Mouse dancing around. And, and of course, Disney was a genius and, uh, and the theme park was a tremendous success. So then they, after some very successful years, they said, well, you know, we could expand this concept. So the next place they went was Florida. And back in the day, you know, Orlando didn't even have an international airport. And people were like, are you crazy? There's nothing there but sand and alligators. Nobody's going to come to Florida to, um, you know, to, to, to stand in the hot sun again and, and look at this theme park. And it was a tremendous success. So then they started to set their sights internationally. And the next theme park they opened, which a lot of people have forgotten about, the next one was Tokyo. Now, Tokyo is not a California or a Florida. It's a, the weather there is horrible. I mean, it's hot and sticky all summer long, and then they have the rainy season, and then it's cold and clammy in the winter. And everybody said, oh, this, you people have just lost it, right? This is crazy. <laughs> um, and, you know, when you're driving on the bus from Narita Airport, you can actually see the, the spires of the Tokyo Disneyland. Um, but again, enormous success. So they had all this success. They had a bunch of assumptions about how people would behave in theme parks. And then they came to Europe. Right. And they decided for a number of reasons <laughs> to locate in France. And I'm positive that the planning committee had one of those those charts, you know, where you have a, a bullseye on the place where the theme park was going to be. And then these concentric rings around it with, you know, who, who lives in those areas. So um, all these people were going to come. Um, and among the mistakes that they made when they came to France was uh, they assumed that people would stay an average of four days, which their experience in other parts of the world had suggested was reasonable. But they opened with about half the rides that they um, had in their plan, that they just hadn't built it out completely yet. Um, plus, uh, Disneyland Europe, which is what it was called at the time, when it was called Euro Disney at the time, was you know a train ride from Paris. So people could come to the park for a day and then go back you know, in the evening. So they started to miss the hotel stay revenue and the, the restaurant revenue and all that sort of thing. They also made some assumptions about how people would behave in theme parks that were not really borne out by the context. So one assumption, just a really trivial one, is if you look at both Americans and Japanese, we're sort of snacking cultures. We, we eat mm -hmm. and drink all day long, you know, and we pop in and have a little something and we're very mobile, right? So you come into a coffee shop, you order your coffee to go. And this was even before Starbucks was such a, a large phenomenon. I mean, they, but, but, you know, very mobile kind of culture. Whereas in Europe, people are much more accustomed to say for lunchtime, you go and you sit down and you have, you treat yourself to a two hour lunch and there's wine and it's, you know, it's lovely. Um, but 
if you've got a theme park that's built for people that are sort of grazing and passing through and your customer base is expecting enough room to sit down and eat, <laughs> you're going to have major problems. And so it was a whole series of kind of extrapolating from their past experience to what turned out to be a very different environment that um, that really led them astray. Now, I will say they did learn from that. I mean, it was a painful and expensive lesson, but Disneyland Europe today is a very popular destination. It it has sort of fulfilled its, um, its, its goal of introducing the Disney experience to Europe, but it was really painful. And our argument was it didn't have to be. If you'd really tested some of those assumptions, you could have learned how different things would be. And I really love this approach again, because, you know, like you reduce the whole story to a few really like the most important numbers. Mm. Like one of the things you said was people on average stay four days. Mm -hmm. right? That's such a concrete number that as a designer, you can take and say, okay, if that's the main thing, like if this breaks, probably everything else breaks because we don't have people in the, in, in the, you know, our Disneyland for long enough. So they're not going to eat. They're not going to stay in hotels. Mm -hmm. So how can we test this cheaper, right? Mm -hmm. And there are always ways to test cheaper than to build like a billion dollar uh, exactly. complex. <laughs> oh, exactly, exactly. So it's just beautiful, like especially for a business designer, like, you know, reducing the whole story to a few numbers that you can test, it's, mm -hmm. it's perfect. It's mm -hmm. awesome. So um, today, actually, I just checked when this article was published. So we were talking, I mentioned this uh, article being published in uh, Harvard Business Review, and actually it was published in 1995. That's right. <laughs> so the question I have for you, how relevant is this approach still? I mean, it feels very relevant for me. Like it's still like very simple math, but I'm just curious, like, like with all the consulting work you do and teaching students and stuff, have you seen anything changing with this uh, basic model? Uh, well, the model I think is pretty... It has been pretty robust. Um, I mean, people have elaborated on it and added their own flavors. And, and of course, that's fine. I mean, that, that, that's, that's the way knowledge progresses. But I think the basic building blocks of the model haven't really changed. Um, I'd make a couple of observations about what has happened since 1995, since a lot's happened since then. Um, firstly, we have the emergence of the lean startup movement. Uh, which you know Eric Ries was was responsible for really popularizing, um, and Lean Startup really came out of Eric's participation as an MBA student with uh, Steve Blank, who's a retired you know serial entrepreneur who taught at Berkeley. Eric was one of his students, and the Lean Startup book kind of came out of that, um, and that's been incredibly popular among um, entrepreneurs, among small business people, and so forth. So, in that way, the concept has really taken off in a very kind of popular. Um, model. You know, people have really popularized mm -hmm. it. The other big thing that I think has happened with discovery-driven thinking is since 1995. I mean, when I was studying in the late 80s, early 90s at the Wharton School, where I was doing my PhD in, in innovation, basically, and in, uh, how organizations develop new capabilities, what I was working on. Um, and that was really the kind of Edith Penrose route to growth. How do you build from internal capabilities? It was very popular at the time, but it was really innovation. And the cool kids in strategy were all doing things like um, industry analysis and the art of Japanese management and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then the idea was really what you wanted was to achieve a sustainable competitive advantage and exploit that forever, you know. And I think what's happened since then is organizations and the people that study them are becoming increasingly aware the competitive advantages are getting shorter, that the period of time in which you have an unquestioned command over some market or some segment is just getting shorter. And so you need to be innovating more consistently. So I think a, a big reason people are now so drawn to discovery-driven planning is that you know, innovation isn't optional anymore. You know, you really have to be doing it on an ongoing basis. So you need the right toolkit. And I think one of the things that appeals to people is um, we have this, I think, misconception that innovation is like this dark art, right? That, um, you know, if you're a designer or an innovator, you, you wear cool black t-shirts and you're like a different species than normal managers. And that, um, you know, and what people don't realize is there's an entire totally practical toolkit around the innovation process, but it's really, really different than what you do to optimize an existing business. And so I think one of the reasons discovery-driven planning has, is sort of enjoying a surge of popularity right now is people are realizing innovation is not optional, and now we need to go out and understand how to do it. And discovery-driven planning is really one of the main building blocks of how that happens.
Yeah. One question I also have here is like many times that I try to, as you said yourself, like when a, a tool becomes very popular, then people take it and use it in different ways. Mm-hmm. So one way that I was always trying to use it, or maybe let me let me try or let me explain it the other way. So the way you also in the book and in the article explain using the discovery driven planning is from the company perspective, mm-hmm. meaning you start with the end goal, right? Which is the profitability. Like let's say this is 10% profitability or whatever, right? And then you work your way back to a level of costs and to the revenue you need to have, basically. So, um, and I'm assuming that was kind of just the best way to explain the whole model because the way I've been using it a lot is focusing not like on a company level, but even like on a smaller level. Like even when you are thinking about increasing conversion rate, like you're working just on a project that needs to increase retention or conversion you know, you can just start with the end goal and work your way back. So like the question I have for you as the master of this approach is like, is that also the way this should be used or is there any way you should be then, you know, if you use it in a smaller setting, so not like on a complete company level, is there something you have to take into account to offset for the smaller context? No, I think it works fine. I mean, the, the basic thesis, right, is when you're in a high assumption to knowledge ratio situation, you need to figure out some way to convert those assumptions to facts. And that could be Mm -hmm. as simple as, you know, what does my school child need to do to succeed at their science project? And it could be all the way up to, you know, what does General Electric need to do to dig itself out of the hole it's gotten itself into? So I I think it really does scale. Um, It's really that fundamental uh, quest to convert assumptions into something that's more replicable you know it's almost like taking a a scientific management approach to business problems Mm -hmm. and i think this really nice nicely ties into um like this whole it's a kind of a trend where a lot of designers see themselves as um risk mitigators for companies like because one of the things that designers are really good at is prototyping Mm -hmm. and with prototypes you basically can reduce the risk by you know hundredfold thousandfold by creating those tangible or intangible things that you can test with so what you were just saying so taking assumptions and actually you know you know just putting them on paper and knowing what assumptions are and just starting to testing them is exactly this right so this is where this business thinking really nicely ties into design thinking right yeah and could i add one thing to that sure. which is one of the things i've always admired about working with companies like ido and and design companies is they're brilliant at saying hey there's not just one prototype like let me give yeah. you 25 let me give you 30 um like don't just let's settle on a point solution see this is where i think business people get themselves into trouble which is they you know they they've identified a problem and then they identify the solution and they settle on one solution yeah. when there could be 50 there could be 100 that would address the problem um so one of the things i say a lot is you know it's great to fall in love with the problem but don't fall in love with a particular solution there may be many that's so true. Like this was one of the hardest things for me when I left the business school and joined a design agency because in the business school, I always had a feeling like we settled on uh, the best looking solution really quickly and we tried to optimize that one solution. Mm-hmm. And in the agency, like we had to stay in this double diamond for like two months and it felt just so stressful in the beginning. But then you mm-hmm. just see how useful it actually is to be wide and to go with different uh, possibilities. Right. And one of the things that I've written about a lot is most organizations are just spectacularly uninformed about what their customer is really going through, you know, what their experience really is and where that experience breaks down, you know, and they forget that in many cases, the biggest competitor you face is non-consumption. I mean, the experience is so unsatisfying or it gets stuck or it, it, you know, people can't really get done what they need to get done. And so they just give up. (laughs) <laughs> you know, and I mean, I was talking to a friend of mine who works in retail, and he said part of the frustration he has with working in retail is he said a cu- customer comes into my store and they have nine things on their list, right? And they can only find four of them, so they buy four and they walk out. And I think I've had a great day, and yet I've fulfilled <laughs> four out of nine of the customer's wishes. Interesting, interesting. So basically, non-consumption being a greater threat to most companies than than competitors itself, right? In many cases, I mean, not not maybe if you're making life essential drugs or something, but for a lot of to- mm-hmm. a lot of consumption scenarios, non consumption is a very viable option. Mm. I mean, if you think yourself about 
something you were toying with buying and you toyed with it for perhaps two or three years before maybe there was some catalytic event that caused you to have to now go <laughs> buy yeah. it. Um, you know, and, and a lot of buying situations are like that. Yeah, yeah. This reminds me of another great topic that you're also uh, working on. This is like the strategy, right? When you start working with a strategy, everybody starts thinking about competitors and how do you outmaneuver them. And as you said with, uh, yourself before, like you trying to build this castle, like this sustainable competitive advantage uh, where today maybe this is not that relevant anymore. But let, let's maybe start from the beginning. Like where does this idea of creating co a sustainable competitive advantage comes from? What does it even mean and why it's not relevant anymore today? Sure. Well, so the whole idea of sustainable competitive advantage, in my opinion, had its roots in what's called industrial organization economics. And if you go way back in history, um, there was a whole group of economists that were very interested in studying the theory of monopoly. And what they were interested in doing, and now this goes back to the 20s, it's 10s, the 20s, and what they were interested in doing. Now, you have to remember the context, right? We had a few really well-capitalized large firms in industries like communications, so this would be telegraph, later on the telephone, um, oil and gas, um, construction, land use. So a few very well-capitalized huge firms um, dominating these sectors. And this group of economists wanted to figure out, well, at what point should government make an intervention? Mm -hmm. So they wanted to understand what created monopoly. And... Um, and there were a number of factors. And then along came people like Michael Porter, uh, who took that theory of monopoly and said, wait a minute, we can actually flip that on its head and we can actually draw a roadmap for firms that would like to get as close to a legal monopoly situation as they could. Right. <laughs> and out of that came the very famous five forces model, where Porter said, if you want to understand a company's potential to achieve a sustainable advantage, you can look at five things. I mean, it was brilliant in its, in its initial formulation, which was, you know, do you have power over your buyers and suppliers? And this was in a world, remember, this is a physical world where supply chains were relatively stable. Uh, so the more power you have over buyers and suppliers, the more you can either get great prices or demand great margins. Uh, the less people are able to enter your sector, the more you can protect it. Uh, so the, le the more entry barriers there are, you know, so does it take a lot of capital to get in? Does it take unique skills? Does it take a particular geographic, whatever? Uh, the lower um, the risk of substitutes. So, you know, if you, what you're making is essential and there are no other sources for getting a particular need met. And then to the extent to which rivalry is not too intense. You know, you kind of, you stick to your swim lane, your competitors stick to their swim lanes and we all have a happy life. And I mean, I think it was brilliant for its day. And it really took that theory of monopoly and applied it to what was possible back then. So that's where the whole idea of sustainable advantage came from. And with it, a number of other ideas. Uh, among those were the idea that your industry explains profitability more than any other factor. And that your position within that industry explains firm level profitability more than any other factor. And so in the intervening years, um, what has changed is a number of things. Uh, firstly, entry barriers have come down everywhere. Um, for a number of reasons. Globalization has certainly played a factor, as has digitization, which means that, you know, many things that used to be really expensive and really hard to do are now inexpensive and easy and available on open markets. We've also had the rise of complements and platforms, which really doesn't factor in industrial economic thinking at all. So in industrial economics, you have discrete firms with clear boundaries in clearly defined industry sectors competing with each other. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm standing Standard Oil, I'm competing with another oil company, right? Or if I'm mm -hmm. IBM, I'm competing with other equipment makers. Um, in the world we live in now, you have industries competing with industries. You have firms that are gaily crossing industry boundaries. You have very few barriers to entry in a substantive sense. Um, and the, those barriers that there are have really changed. So today, in many in sectors, it's access to data. That's the fundamental barrier. So if you're in the 
media, content creation, writing, whatever business, um, you're at a data deficit relative to, say, a Facebook or a Google or whatever. It's very hard for you to break in because they've got this sort of enormous wall of data that they can go back to, as well as a whole ecosystem of advertisers and, and, and so forth and so forth. So I think um, complements is nowhere in the five forces theory. This notion of blurry industry boundaries is not there. And as a consequence, the traditional concept of what created a sustainable competitive advantage has, and it's, it's still a good theory in the right boundary conditions, but there are a lot more cases that people are competing in which don't adhere to those boundary conditions anymore. So that's where I would say the, the idea suffers from a, a, a limit in the applicability of that model. Mm. So you obviously like spent the whole book explaining this. The book is called The End of Competitive Advantage. Mm-hmm. So what do you propose as a solution then? Well, I think you need a new playbook for strategy. Um, and I think it begins with something I call arena-based competition. So rather than thinking about your industry, I mean, human beings made up industries. I mean, God did not come down and say, thou shalt be the microelectronics industry. I mean, it just, we, we forget that, you know, we get so comfortable with sort of reifying what this thing called an industry is that we forget we made it up. Um, so I think the first thing you need to really understand is who who controls the pot of resources that you're considering contesting. Um, then who are the different stakeholders that are that are there, right? And um, what what are the jobs to, they want to have done? So Clay Christensen very famously talked about you know don't think about customers buying products and services think about hiring them and this is very much aligned with design thinking right think about hiring products and services to do jobs for you in your life Um, and you could hire many alternative kinds of products and services to get jobs done in your life so an example of this would be netflix right so netflix has been very public about saying our arena is your disposable time so anything that takes up your disposable time is a competitor as far as we're concerned. So what we want is we want to be so seductive and so successful that you'll willingly set aside the book, the magazine, the glass of wine with your girlfriends, the walk in the park and spend that time with us. I mean, that's, that's their competitive strategy. Um, And what's interesting about that to me is if you define your arena in that way, it, It it opens your mind to who the possible competitors are, what moves you might want to make, and so forth. So I think the end of competitive advantage really got us thinking about how do we think about um, arenas rather than industries. And within an arena, um, where where do you want to play? You know, is who's your competition? Other people contesting disposable time is a really great capsulation of that way of thinking. So how do you properly define the arena you know how do you know you actually found your arena and then once you define what your arena is how do you make a decision where you want to position yourself Mm -hmm. like is there a tool that you suggest designers and business people use or is it more you know uh, ideation and testing so there are a couple of different tools that i use um the let's say there are three um the first one is really looking at customers as they go through their journeys uh, of possible consumption. I call that using a consumption chain. And in my latest book, Seeing Around Corners, what I talk about is each of those links in a chain, each of those experiences customers go through as they're in a consumption context has positives, it has negatives, and, and it has things they don't care about. And a lot of times companies find that there are negatives creeping into the experience that they're not aware of or that they've deliberately designed uh, to be that way. And so a really accessible way to start getting at this notion of arenas is to look at the negatives attached to the existing design of the experience and ask yourself, well, why is it that way? So in the book, I use the example of Uber. Um, and Uber is fascinating to me because I think it's a great customer story and a really terrible business model story. So, uh, <laughs> so we, can, we can sort of separate out. But, but, you know, what they do well, they do well. So if you think about the typical taxi experience before you had Uber, right, what were some of the links in the chain? Well, you had to arrange a ride. You had to be in the ride. You had to pay for the ride. Just three links in that chain. Uh, so arranging a ride, well, traditional taxi companies operated on a centralized dispatch system. So the chances that if you were anywhere but in a densely populated city or town, the chances that a taxi was nearby 
were very small. So, you know, it was a hassle to arrange and they would take a long time to come. And from the perspective of the taxi driver, they were at the mercy of the dispatchers and the dispatchers would have favorites or they would have kickbacks and they'd give the best rides to, you know, certain taxi drivers and not others. Then being in the ride, um, you know, depending on the city that you're in. Um, I mean, in New York City, for example, the taxis were terrible. I mean, the guy's always on the phone or the taxi's dirty or it's just it's just not a pleasant environment. And then paying for the ride, you know, oh no, my credit card machine's broken. I can't take anything but cash, blah, blah, blah. You know, just the whole experience was just riddled with hassles. And so if you then go back and say, well, why is it that way? Well, it was that way because you had centralized dispatch. You had ownership of these assets in terms of the taxis in New York City's case, for example, the medallions, uh, very centralized. They were a monopoly. So they had absolutely no incentive to offer anything but the bare, bare minimum customer service. And because the supply of taxis was limited, they had really no motivation to drive during the rain. You know, once you met your quota for the day, you just went home. Uh, you had no particular motivation to ride where there were less popular locations. Um, you had no particular motivation to make sure there was a plentiful supply of rides where there was a high demand situation. So the whole system, you know, was designed around a monopoly position that that allowed them to offer pretty poor customer experiences. So introduce Uber, right? And now all of a sudden, I've got a distributed model where the ride it's not a taxi, but the ride could be near me. So it could be two blocks away from me. And I, I can now make a match because I've got this app that intermediates between the two of us. So, you know, I can call a distributed network of taxis, the ride itself, because we've got a dual rating system, right? So the riders rate the tech, the driver, the driver rates the riders. So you've got some incentives in the system now to make sure the ride is actually a pleasant experience. Uh, and the payment system's all arranged on the app. It's already done. You know, you just say, yes, I want a tip. No, I don't, whatever. And it's, it's seamless. It's frictionless. It removes the frictions. So I think one of the most accessible ways of defining an arena is to really think about, let's look at the existing experience and identify where there are negatives and how might we do something that would address uh, those negatives. So that that's pretty accessible. To get to an even sort of grander strategy level, and this is something I write about in my most recent book, um, you really say, well, what are our capabilities? And where might those capabilities be relevant, even if they're not in the arena that we're currently competing in? So a great story that I tell in End of Advantage is about Fujifilm. And Fuji is very interesting because they were in the 70s nearly identical to Kodak. They they made their money the same way. They had the same technologies, basically. Um, where Fuji competed, Fuji had a great brand name. And yet, you know, Kodak saw digital. They invented digital um, and basically refused to alter anything. Whereas Fuji saw digital coming and they said, this is the future. And we are going to redirect our resources to um, to focus on the future. And so they took a capability out approach to defining their arena. They said, we have all these capabilities, where might they be relevant, which isn't necessarily film. And I remember being on a panel with one of the people who engineered this phenomenal transformation at Fuji. And he showed a slide that just knocked me away. He, he showed a slide of a microscopically sliced piece of color film and color film is a really complicated thing. People don't realize this, but it could be as many as 40 or 50 micro layers of, of film and chemistry that go into a, like a cell of color film. And then he showed the exact same micro thin layer of a slice of human liver. And he said, what we realized was we could take the capabilities we developed in film processing and take those exact same capabilities and explore areas of growth in uh, healthcare, in cosmetic imagery, in different kinds of imaging. And today, you know, Fuji is a, a relevant, thriving, healthy company because it basically said, we're going to take a capability out view of our arena rather than saying, let's take a customer back view. And either way is legitimate. I mean, you can anchor a co company many different ways. Um, and I, I think Fuji is a great example because they really, they didn't, they didn't blind themselves to where, you know, we're, we're a film company. They said, no, you know, we have these capabilities at deep science and understanding the structure, the microstructures of things and you know, really, really skilled imaging, where might that be relevant? Can you just explain a little bit again, what's the difference between capability out and if I understand correctly, customer back approach? Sure. So a customer back approach would be looking at the, what the customer's job is to try to get done. 
And Mm -hmm. what are the obstacles in the way of getting that job done? So I think Amazon's a great example, right? If you take any link in a customer consumption chain from awareness of need, searching for a solution, identifying a supplier, purchasing, you know, repurchasing, blah, 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 any one of those links, if you really think about it, Amazon has probably done 50 things that make that link better faster, cheaper, more convenient. I mean, if you just take awareness, right? So, gee, I'm aware. I like Rita McGrath's books. Um, You know, how might I capitalize on awareness that Rita McGrath exists in the world and I might like her books? Well, you know, think about it. You go to an Amazon, right? And what they'll show you is people who bought this book also bought that book. So if I'm reading a book by, say, Michael Porter on strategy, it they might pop up with, well, you might also want to have a look at Rita McGrath's books on strategy. Um, they will email you. They'll say, hey, you know, if you sign up for an interest list, Rita McGrath has a new book coming out. You bought her previous books. Um, people in your community, your organization, your whatever bought the book. Um, we can have this book for cheap on resale, right? You don't have to buy it new, mm-hmm. you can buy it. So just at awareness, they've got 50 things they're doing to improve that experience and they're constantly testing and learning how to make that experience better. So that's what I would call a customer focused anchor to the business. So reduce frictions, make it more convenient, make it cheaper. And the way Jeff Bezos of Amazon talks about this is he said, you know, I try to anchor my company on things that won't change. He said, I cannot conceive of a conversation five years from now where a customer says to me, oh, Jeff, you know, I love Amazon. I just wish you'd ship me things more slowly and that I'd have to pay more for them, right? I mean, there's just no planet on which that is even going to be conceivable. So um, so that's customer. Um, now, the capability focus is a little bit different, which is saying I've got these deep capabilities at doing something, you know, at at achieving a certain outcome, where in the world might those capabilities be relevant? And I think a a company like uh, W.L. Gore or Corning would be examples of those kind of, or Fuji uh, would be an example of those kind of companies where they're saying, here are some deeply difficult things we know how to do. They're classes of problems we know how to solve. Let's find places in the world where those classes of problems have um, some utility even if it's not within our industry or even if it's not whatever. So Fuji into medical imaging is a great example, right? So the things we learned when we were film processors are highly relevant to getting diagnostics and medical images in the healthcare field. And we're not going to be limited by the fact that it isn't film processing. You know, we're going to say they have a problem. We have the solution. Let's make make a business out of those two. So I think those are the two, well, two of the kinds of ways of centering a company. That's really cool. And what I see both of these approaches having in common is the fact that they're not thinking about a product or a industry that they're in, but they're thinking either from the perspective of that's what the customer wants or that's what we can do. And it almost feels to me like if you're a big company, maybe you want to be capability out. And if you're a smaller one, you may not have so many capabilities yet. So maybe you want to be the customer back one. Mm. Is that how you're thinking too? Or is it... Um. With that that really depends um, because many small companies are founded on a scientific insider discovery. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, I'm not sure that I would cut it that way. What I do think small companies tend to be better at is, you know, they tend to be a lot closer to their customers. They don't have multiple layers between the customer and decision makers at the company. So they tend to find it easier to really be responsive and agile with, with respect to changing mm-hmm. customer needs. I think it's, it's easier from a, from a, you know, decision making point of view. Hmm. What's really exciting from the perspective of designer, like both of these approaches have one thing in common, which is you need to know what the customer's need is, right? Even if you start with capabilities, you still want to search for a customer wants or needs that are being unfulfilled, mm-hmm. right? And vice versa. So, and what is even most exciting to me hearing you talk about this now is the fact that it feels like the customer journey. Like that's something that designers do pretty frequently, like the journey from knowing that you need something to buying it and disposing of it is, is kind of at the center of, mm-hmm. it could be the future of strategy design, right? So just mm-hmm. starting with the customer, understanding what's happening with a journey. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, and, you know, companies often get that wrong. Um, so an example I love to use is uh, I had a, a box of books that I wanted to ship to a client um, and I wrapped up the box. And from the client, I had their FedEx number. I had their address. I had my number and address in a minute and a piece of paper, right, with everything that you would need to ship a package from point A to point B uh, clearly laid out. So the delivery guy shows up to pick up the package, opens the door. I hand him my box and he looks at it. And he's horror in his face. And he says, this doesn't have a label. 
I said, well, okay, um, you know, go get a label from your truck and I'll happily fill it out <laughs> for you. And he says, I don't carry labels on my truck. And I'm thinking to myself, okay. And I'm not, you know, I'm not angry with him. It's not his fault. He's in this system that's really badly designed. I said, well, how, how then would I go about getting a label? And he very helpfully says, oh, we could overnight you one. <laughs> 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 or, or, or I think I think you can get one on the internet, um, and and the guy left. I mean, he left me in my box, standing there, kind of forlornly on my doorstep. Um, and you know, and I'm I am positive the good people at FedEx. If I sat them down and said, "Why did this happen?" They would say, "Oh, well, the label is where you know the delivery function and the customer payment function and the inventory function and the truck routing and everything about how they'd run their business all comes together." So, you know, we are incapable of functioning without that label. But honestly, is that your customer's problem? Should it be your customer's problem? No. And my argument would be if you had an Uber or somebody, a company like that, doing this service, it would all be on a mobile phone. Um, they would know who I was before they even got to my place, right? They would know where I wanted the package to go before I even got there because they would have had all that information when I ordered the driver to come pick that up. It would have all been mobile. Anything they needed, they could have gotten by taking a picture of the piece of paper, and we would have been done, right? So that's an mm -hmm. example of, you know, and I'm not, I think FedEx is an amazing organization. So I'm not, this is not like a personal attack against FedEx, but it is an example of how by constructing this optimized machine to get packages from A to B, you can actually overlook what the customer experience really is like. Mm. So if there is an end of competitive advantage, you know, what's the future? So you talk about the transient competitive advantage, right? Well, what is that? So I, I define transient advantage as really being cognizant that any competitive advantage has a life cycle and some are longer than others. You know, life cycles in the aerospace industry are very long. They're years. Uh, life cycles in something like cosmetics <laughs> or fashion are very short, um, but, but they have life cycles. And the life cycle consists of a period of innovation, which is where new advantages come from, a period of exploitation when you got the thing in place and you're making money and this is great. But then there's a period of erosion where, Customers' needs have changed. Technologies have moved on. Um, you know, things have things have really shifted. And when I talk about transient advantage, what I think about is a firm or an, an organization that has many different advantages, all in different stages. So you may have the same kind of advantage that's in a different stage of its life cycle, depending on where you are in the world. Right? There could be some advantages. Let's say you make um, um, parts for manufacturing companies. Well, if you were in China, right? Chances are that's still in your exploitation stage. You're still really exploiting it and so forth. But if you were selling in the US, that might well be an erosion because manufacturing has gone elsewhere. So I think part of the transient advantage idea is to be cognizant of you know, what's in what stage and where. And then the, 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 the management of that involves what I call healthy disengagement. So when something is going into decline, you know, you need to be able to take resources out of that and use it to fund the next generation of exploratory investment. So I think it's, it's sort of surfing waves of advantage is the analogy that I use. Um, now, what doesn't change? What doesn't change are very often the core capabilities that let you get into different advantages, remain consistent. Uh, your talent, to the extent you can hang on to people that are the secret sauce of your firm, the culture, you know, that, that doesn't necessarily change, although it may, express itself, it may express itself in the marketplace in very different ways. Mm. So how, let's say that you are not really the CEO, you're, like, you're not really like the senior leader of the company, but you, because you're on the fringes and you see around the corners, and we can talk about it in a bit, but if you're on the, you know, like you are closer to the customers and you can see that a certain wave that your company is riding right now is getting close to the end, how do you make that, how do you communicate in a way that senior leaders are going to listen to you? Do you have any advice for like designers that are on the ground and they see things, but they just, they can't really express it in the language yeah. that... <laughs> Leaders yeah. Oh, it's a perennial problem. And it actually is one of the most significant sources of blind spots. Um, you know, people call it the Cassandra problem, right? So Cassandra was a Greek, um, an ancient Greek woman who was 
bestowed by the gods with the power of foresight and cursed by the gods with the fact that nobody would listen to her. So she saw all these <laughs> horrible things coming and nobody would pay any attention. Uh, and I think very often people that are on the front lines are like Cassandra's, right? People don't listen to them. So a couple of things that I have found to be helpful. Uh, first is use your network of allies. So don't just be the lone voice in the wilderness build a coalition of people who are also seeing similar things. And, you know, one person's pretty easy to ignore. A hundred people, especially if they're high potential people or they're very sought after hires, much harder to ignore. And if you look at what employees at organizations like Google, for example, are doing, right? They, they don't go at it alone. They form coalitions and they say things like, we really don't think you should be um, doing business in China, or we don't think you should be doing X, Y, Z. And they do have actually a, an impact on decision-making very high up in the company. So I think the first idea would be form a coalition and, and try mm -hmm. to develop a common point of view. Uh, second idea is make it real. And this is where I think designers just are so much more um, blessed than many other functions. Because what designers can do is they can make something feel and look real that doesn't exist yet. Yeah. So, you know, design an experience, make a video, make a clip, you know, bring that future into a reality where an executive could actually experience it, right? And and that often um, is is more powerful than anything. Telling, telling the story, right? Telling the story of the future. Um, I have a wonderful colleague, Jane Prager, who teaches storytelling at a, at a class. And she can point to literally hundreds of examples in business and politics and, and you know, life where the facts and figures get ignored for like decades. And then someone comes up with a really gripping story. And that's what actually gets the, the decision made or the, the movement done. I mean, human beings respond to storytelling. We don't respond to dry facts and figures. So I think sometimes designers feel like, oh, geez, I've got to be corporate speak and it's got to be PowerPoint and it's got to be you know, spreadsheets. And I don't think so. Tell a great story. Storytelling. That's supposed to be one of the, another great superpowers of design. So Exactly. <laughs> so as I mentioned, like your last book, Seeing Around Corners, is exactly about this, right? So how having blind spots for companies really leads us to losing uh, competitive advantages, etc. So um, can you talk a little bit about the basic premise of the book? And then uh, I'd like to tie, back, tie, tie it back to the um, discovered room planning, because sure. if I... Um, so going through the book, I realized that actually, you know, these two books then come together at a certain point. <laughs> they do. They do very much. So um, my interest in strategic inflection points was sparked by Andy Grove's work in the 1990s. Uh, and he wrote a fabulous book called Only the Paranoid Survive. And it was the first book, mainstream book, that was very successful that talked about strategic inflection points. And Grove's book was really about... I'm in it, you know, I, I am in the midst of a strategic inflection point. Everything about my business is going to change. How do I navigate through this? Um, and his, his main thesis in that book was, he said, you know, you have to let chaos reign and then you have to get enough information where you say, okay, this is the path forward and then we really need to focus. So that sort of divergence, convergence idea when you're in the middle of a strategic inflection point. And I got to thinking about, um, well, you know, what what would you do as a strategist before that moment, before the inflection point is here? How how would you go back in time and really look at what um, you know what what are the signals? What are the weak signals yeah. that you might be able to observe? And one of the big ahas in the evolution of the book was that inflection points take an awfully long time to actually appear. Uh, the early warnings are sometimes in place for decades before um, before the thing becomes uh, real. So as an example, uh, I was with my dad uh, this past weekend and we had an idea and we said, oh, you know, let's talk to my brother. And I got on my cell phone and we FaceTimed my brother and uh, and he happened to be at home. He picked up. We had a lovely like 15 minute conversation face to face. You know, it was great. Um, well, if you think about it, this idea of instantaneous face to face real time communication AT&T was working on this in 1965. I mean, they had this phone, right? That was like a camera phone. And, and there have been multiple, multiple iterations of this since then. I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent on visual communication, remote visual communication. And yet it's not until you have high-speed broadband, 
uh, high fidelity cameras, supercomputers in your pocket, or systems like the one we're using right now, where all those ecosystem pieces come together, where literally at the click of a mouse, you've got an image and you can have a conversation. Um, and, and so there was an awful lot of technology that had to ripen, the use case had to ripen, you know, the, the, the comfort level people had with remote communication had to be there. So you could see that human beings would love a way to converse face-to-face -face remotely. I mean, that was true in the 1960s, but we didn't have all the pieces that we needed to make it an everyday reality for decades. And so the basic idea behind um, seeing around corners is if you set up a system that's prepared to pick up those weak signals about what are the jobs to be done customers are going to want, where might this be in the future, that you can then start to create an early warning system, which would alert you to um, the fact that things might be changing. Now, here's the really interesting recent wrinkle, and I've got a Harvard Business Review article coming out on this um, later this, this year, that Ironically, the best way to respond to truly disruptive circumstances is a non-disruptive response. It's by making a series of discovery-driven experiments, which allow you to increasingly gain insight into this potential inflection point, so that by the time it's upon you, it's no big deal. You've already prepared. And so a couple of examples of that would be um, Nike and the way it has gone after the direct-to-consumer business, which is a huge trend across all of retail, right? So you've got mm -hmm. firms like Gillette reeling because um, Dollar Shave Club and Harry's are taking their market share, and you've got furniture makers going out of business because we can now either order furniture online or we can actually rent it, you know, very cheaply. We can subscribe to furniture you now. Um, whereas as if, if you look at Nike, um, a couple of just points to think about are in 1987, they developed this thing called the Nike Monitor based on the premise that runners would like to get information about their athletic performance. And so they had this kludgy thing you, you tied around your waist and had sensors that pointed at the ground and little feedback mechanisms that went up into your ears. And it was kind of a disaster. But the concept that runners, that athletes would like information about their running um, never really died. They thought, you know, that is a job that, that runners might like to get done. And it really became a commercial success for the very first time in the mid O's, I would say, when Nike partnered with Apple to create Nike Plus. And Apple made a, a trans, well, I guess Nike made the transponder. I'm not quite sure who made what, but there was a transponder that went together with your iPad, with your yeah. iPod. And then, you know, you're, people have forgotten this, but back in the day, how, the way you got music on your iPod was you literally physically plugged it into your computer and that <laughs> synced everything, right? Yeah. Um, and, and that would then upload your running information to a central place. And, and it turned out runners loved this. They liked to be able to compare their performance over time, compare their performance to a cohort, see what improvements they made, blah, 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 blah. Well, today, N Nike Plus is a membership group. Um, it's called Nike Plus. It's, on, it's got a website. It's got all these assets. And there's something like 135 million people that belong to this. And so here we are in this moment when direct-to-consumer is the big retail thing. And as far as Nike is concerned, it's a snooze. It's like, yeah, we were way ahead of that, right? And, uh, and, and so we have built the capabilities to have direct connections with customers. We've built the analytical capability to know what we're seeing. Um, you know, we've got our designers, you know, part of the mix to yeah. get that sort of feedback loops very intensely from, from customers. And they've made direct-to-consumer. They actually call it the direct-to-consumer offense is the name of the strategy. But it's a great example of you know, they didn't just sort of say, oh, my God, direct-to-consumer is here. Let's get on this. It was this sort of series of discovery-driven experiments all along the way to figure out when this would actually be a real thing. So you take, like, any early warning for a new trend, for new uh, customer needs or wants or technologies, and you start playing with it early to see how it could affect your business, right? Yeah, yeah. So the way I define an inflection point, and this might be helpful, is it's something that makes a 10x change in the variables that your business is based on. So, uh, you know, for your designer listeners who might not be, you know, MBAs or whatever, there's a concept in the world of MBAs called uh, key performance indicators or key metrics. Mm -hmm. And key metrics are based on the past. So if I run a retail store, traditionally, everything I do to drive performance has to do with my physical real estate, my physical space. 
Um, and so all the metrics are things like same store sales, same store relative to last year, uh, comparable store sales, inventory turns, you know, everything has to do with this fundamental limitation. Now, what an inflection point does is it changes the envelope of limitations that you're living in. So once I have the internet, once I have alternative ways of selling things to people, that limitation of physical floor space goes away. Therefore, my key metrics are going to be something very different. Um, and I'm not saying when that first becomes clear that you should make a huge effort. Um, I mean, Amazon was founded in 1995, and there were already fortune writers writing about how this completely revolutionized the way we consume books and music and, you know, you name it. Um, but think about the world of 1995, right? How did we even get on the internet? It was dial-up modems, typically <laughs> through a large ISP like America Online or whatever the equivalent was in Europe. It was slow, right? It was unreliable. It was very uncertain. We didn't know how to pay for things on the internet. We didn't know how to assure quality. You know, you're going to give your credit card to somebody you don't even know over, over a phone line. I'm like, no. And so bit by bit, the ecosystem around what we today realize as e-commerce has matured, but it didn't happen overnight. And I would mm -hmm. argue retailers that prepared themselves, like Nike, um, have really... Um, gained great growth from this transition. Whereas people who just sort of said, this is, doesn't affect us, that's not how we do business, have really come to grief. So I think the idea of seeing around corners is this whole idea of, you know, let's not be massively disruptive. You know, let's take it piece by piece. Let's use a discovery-driven mindset to test the hypotheses about how the world is really changing. And then when we have something that we think we can now believe in. We've, we've reduced our assumptions. We now have some knowledge. That's when you can start to make increasing amounts of investment. So some designers listening to this podcast are actually working in so-called innovation labs. And many companies are now starting these innovation labs to keep up exactly with these type of things. What happens if we, I don't know, if this technology takes up, uh, et cetera, right? So my question for you is, how are these innovation labs, are they like a good are they good for um, keeping an eye on like what is around the corner or are there more things we have to take into account when we set up innovation lab to make it really impactful for the future? Yeah, unfortunately, innovation labs in many instances are really just what I call innovation theater, right? It's, it's, it's thousands of post-it notes and lots of cool people walking around in dark t-shirts with really great you know, eyeglasses, um, and, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and uh, kind of cool design types, but, uh, but it doesn't have the connective tissue back to the parent organization. And so yeah. they may make incredibly cool discoveries. And of course, the, the, the granddaddy of this cautionary tale is Xerox Park. I mean, Xerox Park nailed it. They nailed graphical user interfaces. They nailed the Ethernet. They nailed, you know, human machine interaction. I mean, they they had it all. But Xerox, the parent company, had absolutely no idea what to do with any of that. And so there wasn't connective tissue back to uh, the core corporation. So for an innovation lab to work or an innovation outpost to work, you really need a very conscious design for connecting that entity back to the parent corporation. So mm -hmm. in Seeing Around Corners, I talk about an example I really admire, which is the example of the German metals company Klockner. And what their CEO realized was all around the steel business uh, were new platforms that customers were doing business. And, you know, Amazon, Google, you know, those kinds of platforms um, where people were doing business in a very frictionless way. And he had this insight that, oh, my God, you know, we're in an industry that literally is still placing orders by fax. I mean, that's how just behind the times we are. And he had this vision that Klockner needed to digitize and that if, if the steel business didn't digitize, somebody was going to digitize around them. So it's almost exactly the same insight as the taxi cabs versus Uber situation, right? It, mm -hmm. it is that way, not because it should be, but because that's historically how it's grown up. So what, what they did at Klockner was um, they started off trying to do this in, internally in Duisburg. Um, and that really wasn't very successful. So they said, okay, we need, we need to get some new capability into this organization. So they took two designers and they sent them off to Berlin. So in sort of the Silicon Valley of Germany, right? <laughs> and they said, look, we don't mind what you do. We want you to do something, anything that makes it easier for customers to do business with us. So, you know, 
use the startup way, use discovery driven planning, use lean methodology, whatever you want to do, do something that makes it easier for customers to do business with us. So these two people, um, you know, embedded in this ecosystem, um, came up with a way of getting rid of faxes. Okay, let's get rid of fax orders. Well, we'll digitize that, right? Now, the interesting thing was they digitized the front end that the customer could see, but the back end where the orders arrived at Klockner was exactly the same. So we've now got a process that's working, right? It's easier for the customer. It's easier for the back end people because, you know, you could, instead of retyping the orders from the faxes, it could now repopulate their machine. Now, that is a very, very simple, modest, it almost looks incremental, right? to what they did. So then they said, well, okay, now that we've got digital orders going, why don't we digitize the inventory? So so they started to create, you know, an online inventory capability. And again, for the core people in the core business, that was an improvement, right? It meant they didn't have to retype and rekey and the systems could talk to each other. And so that was kind of good. Um, then they said, all right, now that we've got that working, maybe we do an online shop where we actually let customers directly have access to our inter internet to, to our inventory and mm -hmm. they can pick what they want and it'll print out an order and, and then the, the pickers can fulfill that order. But again, we're not upsetting or disturbing the sort of the great beast back home, right? We're, we're making their lives better as at the same time that we're digitizing. Right? Um, now what Klockner did, which I thought was just brilliant, was they saw far enough ahead to say, so once we've got transparency and visibility throughout our supply chain, the the material itself is not going to be where we're going to make our profits. Instead, we're going to make our profits on the deep capability and skill we have around what we do with those materials. So what they started to do was very consciously connect the people in the innovation center in Berlin with the people who were the deep experts, the engineers, the scientists, the people who really understand metals in Duisburg. And they started to have exchanges between the two. So if you're a person who's in the core business, right, and you want to do like a secondment to Berlin for some time, you can do that. If you're in Berlin, you can go back to Duisburg and really learn about what, what's going on like deep, deep in the heart of the company. So they set up a very um, conscious exchange mechanism between the two. Now, the point I'm trying to make for your designer listeners is it wasn't like innovation's great and all the cool kids are doing innovation and you people back in the core business are, you know, dinosaurs. And it wasn't, oh, the core business runs everything and we have nothing to learn from the cool kids. It was really a very conscious bringing together of the skill sets of those two groups. And so without something like that, your innovation outposts are almost destined to follow this pattern, which is, you know, somebody says, damn it, you know, we need more innovation around here. Let's create an innovation <laughs> lab. And so they build this beautiful innovation lab. And that goes on for, you know, two or three years. And they're actually making progress. They're doing cool stuff. But they're kind of on an island. And then there's an economic setback, or there's a change of regime, or somebody new comes in and says, what the hell are we doing this for? What's the ROI on that? And they shut it down. And then this goes away for two or three years. And then somebody else comes in and says, you know, damn it, we need more innovation around here. And the whole thing comes back again. And I've just seen this so many times in my life, this episodic kind of innovation. Yeah. Um, and so you really need to be very thoughtful about what, what connectors you make between your innovation outpost. We used to call them skunk works, right? Between your skunk works and the parent company. Um, now, let's say that you are in a situation where you're convinced your core business is just going to disappear, right? Very, very difficult. And a company like Adobe did this. Um, I mean, at that point, you need a cross-company total corporate commitment to making that change happen. But that's not an innovation outpost. That is a fundamental rewiring of your core business. So when Adobe went from selling shrink wrap box software to selling software in the cloud, I mean, that was a complete shift in their business model. And it took a huge level of corporate commitment. And that and that's a case that a lot of designers are familiar with because they, okay, <laughs> have they to lived through the it, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. No, but I think it's great that you gave us these two stories because, as you earlier said, like storytelling is one of the best ways we can uh, make change happen in the companies. So, if anyone is working in innovation labs and feels like they don't have this access to the to the real people in the company, they can just use these two stories, right? The Xero, the Xerox, and what was the second one's name? A Klockner. A Klockner, yeah, from Germany. Yeah. So that's perfect. Yeah. Rita, I want to thank you a lot for all uh, the stories you share with us, for all the knowledge you share with us. And just as a last question, where can listeners find more about you, about your books? How can they stay in touch? 
Oh, I'd love it to, if they stayed in touch. Uh, so my website is uh, RitaMcGrath.com. And on the website, you'll find ways to contact me. I publish a monthly newsletter. And each month, what I'm doing this year, which might be of interest to your listeners, is I take a different sector. And I look at where it is today, what I see is the early warnings, and then I use one of the tools from the book to actually, pre not predict, but to, to articulate what some different future scenarios might be and what the early warnings would be of those scenarios. So each month, you're going to actually get a worked example of one of the tools from the book applied to a different sector. So, so far this year, I've done holiday shopping and how that's changed. And then uh, last month, I did the um, fast fashion business. So, you know, we've now gotten in this stage where a, a colleague calls it fashion bulimia, right? We buy clothes that go to a landfill, we buy more clothes, it's crazy. Um, and so what, what's likely to happen in that sector? And this month, I'm going to be looking at women and wealth. And what are some of the big, yeah, what are some of the big, what's well, for International Women's Month, right? So uh, what are some of the big shifts that women controlling more of the world's wealth might imply? Um, and so each month I do something different. There's also an archive of old newsletters going back probably five or six years, which you can find on the website. So that that's a, and, and there's also on the website, there's blogs, there's posts, there's links to videos and podcasts like this. There's all kinds of stuff there. So uh, if you want to be part of my world, that's a good place to be. The newsletter's free. Um, I don't use the signups for anything other than the newsletter. So don't worry about being deluged with spam because we hate that too. <laughs> um, so feel free to sign up, uh, be part of the community that way. Um, I am at Columbia Business School for your colleagues that might actually want more of an immersion experience. I run two examples executive education courses there. Uh, one is called Leading Strategic Growth and Change, and that's a five-day course that runs in New York City. And it, it would be a perfect course for designers looking to really understand more about growth and, and from the business side. Um, yeah. and, uh, so, and then I run a three-day course for women in leadership, which is for you know women seeking to have a greater impact and advance their careers more rapidly. So that's sort of through Columbia. And then the last thing that people might be interested in is uh, I'm busy working with a partner company that is building software to help manage this whole portfolio of innovations that I think is so critical to making innovation a reality. Um, and if your organizations are interested in, you know, how do I collect ideas? How do I plan them using discovery-driven methods? And then how do I keep track of the whole portfolio of stuff I'm working on? And that's available in beta. And uh, if you're interested, I'd love to hear from you um, because uh, we're, we're just looking for forward-thinking companies to sort of iron the kinks out and, uh, and reduce our own set of assumptions. <laughs> <laughs> so feel free to reach out. Feel free to email me. Uh, I'm pretty easy to find. That's amazing. Thank you again, Rita. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So that's everything in today's episode. If you have any comments about this episode, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn or just send me an email at alan at beyondusers.com. And again, if you want to learn more about business to become a better design leader, uh, you can sign up for a seven-day mini MBA course, um, which is completely free. And yeah, you can find it on beyondusers.com.